Well, thank you and congratulations to, uh, to all the graduates. You know, Patrick Henry is a fantastic place. It has a relatively short history, but uh, look at all that's happened already. Uh, all these awards for debating. One of the lessons is never argue with somebody from Patrick Henry College. I think that's important. Uh, we actually have one of our uh, new interns at American Cornerstone, uh, Dale Fryer, who's from Patrick Henry College. And uh, looking for great things for all of these graduates. You know, as you pursue so many things, including the American dream, have you ever stopped to think about the fact that America is the only country with a dream? There's no French dream. There's no Canadian dream. The Canadians thought they had one until recently, but we're the only ones. <laughs> we're the only ones who have a dream. And it's known about all over the world. Why do people want to come here? Because of the opportunities, the atmosphere for innovation and creativity, something that all of you have an opportunity to take advantage of. You know, my American dream was to be a doctor. It was the only thing that interested me as a youngster. I used to love anything that had to do with medicine. On TV, Dr. Kildare, Dr. Casey. The graduates know, have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> but anything on the radio. I even like going to the doctor's office. I mean, I would gladly accept a shot just so I could smell the alcohol swabs. I mean, <laughs> It was great. Maybe not a COVID shot, but, uh, <laughs> but there was a problem. And that is that I was not a very good student. You know, you have to have good grades to go to medical school. I was a terrible student. I was probably the worst student. Everybody teased me and called me names. But I did admire the smart kids. And I wouldn't let them know it, but I, I had great admiration for them including the smartest kid in the class, his name was Steve. And he would always come up to you after a test, hold his A in your face, say, let me see yours. You wanted to let him see it, all right. But, uh, but you know, there was one person who really believed in me. And it's a tribute to all you parents and grandparents out there. It was my mother. She was always saying, Benjamin, you're much too smart to be bringing home grades like this. I brought them home anyway, but she was always saying things that were encouraging. And she didn't know what to do. You know, she had a very difficult life herself. Uh, born to a very large rural family in Tennessee, poverty stricken, shifted from home to home could achieve less than a third grade education, got married at age 13, trying to escape dire poverty. And uh, she and my father moved to Detroit where he was a factory worker and a part-time preacher. And uh, she discovered some years later that he was a bigamist, had another family. I remember telling that story at a graduation at the University of Utah. Nobody thought it was that strange. <laughs> but obviously she thought that was pretty strange. And uh, so that resulted in a divorce and we were homeless for a while. Ended up moving in with some relatives in Boston. Typical tenement, large multifamily dwelling, boarded up windows and doors, sirens and gangs, rats and roaches, murders. Both of my older cousins who we adored were killed. That was the environment. But my mother truly believed that education was the key. And she prayed and she asked God to give her the wisdom to know what to do. And he gave it to her, at least in her opinion. My brother and I didn't think it was all that wise because it was to turn off the TV. Let us watch only two or three TV programs during the week and with all that spare time, read two books apiece from the Detroit Public Libraries and submit to her written book reports. 
which she couldn't read, but we didn't know that. <laughs> and, you know, I really hated it in the beginning, but uh, we were desperately poor, but I could escape that poverty between the covers of those books. I could be anybody, I could go anywhere, I could do anything. And as I began to read about these amazing people, entrepreneurs and explorers and scientists and surgeons, I began to realize that the person who has the most to do with what happens to you is you. It's not somebody else. It's not some circumstance. And I changed my attitude completely. If I had five minutes, I was reading a book. My nickname became Bookworm. Within the space of a year and a half, I went from the bottom of the class to the top of the class, much to the consternation of all those kids who were teasing me and calling me dummy. And I remember after a test going up to Steve, <laughs> and I said, Steve, how'd you do on the exam? He poked out his chest, he said, oh, I got a 91. I said, well, gee, that's too bad. Oh, I got a 100. <laughs> and I said, if you need help next time, let me know. <laughs> now, that was probably a little obnoxious. And I hope that you graduates won't be like that. But be thankful that the Lord has given you the resources to do well. You know, think about this. I had the same brain when I was at the bottom of the class that I had when I was at the top of the class. What does that tell you about human potential? We were made in the image of God, including our brains. The human brain, the most fantastic organ system in the universe, billions and billions of neurons, hundreds of billions of interconnections, it can process more than two million bits of information in one second. It remembers everything you've ever seen, everything you've ever heard. You can't overload it. You've heard people say sometimes don't learn this, you overload your brain. You can't overload the human brain. If you learned one new fact every second, it would take you more than three million years to challenge the capacity of the human brain. It's not something that we ever have to worry about. And, you know, one of the things that we have to be thinking about with those great brains, what you need to be thinking about with those great brains, is how do we preserve our nation? How do we preserve freedom in our nation? You know, the founders of our nation were amazing people, even though there are some people who are trying to denigrate them because they had slaves, some of them had slaves. You know, people who try to make that argument don't know much about history. Virtually every society in history has had to deal with slavery. So the United States was not unique in having slavery. We were unique, however, in having so many people who were vehemently against it that we fought a bloody civil war to get rid of the evil institution. And that's what we need to be teaching our children. We need to teach them the true history of America, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But the fact is there's a lot more good than there is bad and ugly. And we need to preserve that. And you know, at the last Constitutional Convention in 1787, the guys were just arguing so vehemently. And it looked like the whole thing was gonna fall apart. And then the elder statesman, 81-year-old Benjamin Franklin got up and he said, gentlemen, stop. He said, let's get down on our knees and let's seek wisdom from the Lord. And they knelt down and they prayed. And they got up and they resolved their issues and they gave us the Constitution of the United States of America. One of the greatest documents ever penned. But when Benjamin Franklin came out of that Constitution Hall, he was asked, Sir, what do we have? A monarchy or a republic? And he said, a republic 
if you can keep it. If you can keep it. It's going to be you young people who will make that determination. Will we, in fact, be able to keep it? And what we have to do is we have to help people to understand that we, the American people, are not each other's enemies. And we can't allow the forces of evil to divide us on the basis of race, age, income, religion, political affiliation, gender, you name it. All of those things are happening. The United States of America is much too strong to be brought down by Russia or China or North Korea or Iran. But we can't be brought down from inside. Jesus said it best, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Abraham Lincoln reinforced it. It was true then, it's true now. And we all have spheres of influence that we can use to get that point across. Think about the symbol of our nation, the bald eagle. You know why it's called a bald eagle? Most people think it's because it looks like it has a bald head. Not true. It comes from the old English word piebald, which means crowned with white. And we just shortened it from piebald to bald. So the next time you make me to know it all, you tell them about that, because they will not know the answer to that. But think about that symbol, the eagle. It has a left wing and a right wing. Can't fly with two left wings, can't fly with two right wings. Can soar majestically when they work together. And we have to get people to understand that just because you disagree, it doesn't make you enemies. In fact, I'm fond of saying if two people agree about everything, one of them isn't necessary. <laughs> and I think everybody is necessary and we just need to learn to respect each other, respect each other's opinions. I think it will make a big difference. And then we also need to recognize who is in charge. You know, there will come times when you'll be saying, Lord, you're neglecting me. I asked for something. You're not giving it to me. You know, the Lord plays the long game. We sometimes are looking for short time solutions. I remember uh, some years ago, I was asked to come to South Africa. Uh, to head up a team in an attempt to separate type uh, vertical uh, craniopagus twins that were joined at the back of the head, occipital craniopagus twins. We had done that operation before, so they wanted me to come and uh, lead the team. And the twins were deteriorating very rapidly. And so this was done on an emergent basis because they didn't know why they were deteriorating so rapidly. Well, when it came to the operation, we opened up their chest to put them on hypothermic arrest. It was discovered that one of the twins had a non-functional heart. It wasn't beating. And that kind of explained why they were getting worse because as they were growing, the one twin had to do all the cardiac work for both twins. They were going into congestive failure. So we completed the separation. Obviously, the one with no cardiac function was not viable. But the other one was doing well, so we were pleased with that. Except within a couple of days, that one died too. And it turns out on autopsy that that one had no kidneys. The other one had the kidney function. So one had the kidney function, one had the heart function. And I was devastated. Traveling back home, I was saying, Lord, you didn't need me to fail. Anybody could have done that. How did, how'd you get me involved with this? But what was happening there is I was thinking about me. I wasn't thinking about the big picture. And sometimes we can't see what God has in store. But a couple of years later, there was a set of twins 
from Zambia. They would join at the top of the head facing in opposite directions, something we call type 2 vertical craniopicus. Thirteen attempts have been made to separate twins like that before, none of which were successful. And I was asked to head up that team. And it was a very complex operation, but the team that had been put in place for the operation a couple of years before and all the equipment that had been brought in from all over the world was still there. And uh, 19 hours into the case, it looked so complex. I said, maybe we should just stop and cover things over. There were blood vessels going in every direction. It looked like a bowl of spaghetti. And I said, if we cover everything over, come back in a few months, things will delineate themselves. And they said, that's a great idea. And I know that would work at Johns Hopkins, but we don't have the ability to keep partially separated twins alive. They'll die. And now I really felt the weight of the world on my shoulders. I didn't have all my fancy equipment that I have at Hopkins. I had my scalpel, my loops, and a prayer on my lips. I said, Lord, it's up to you. And I went in and started operating. And frankly, I do not remember what I did over the next several hours. But the other neurosurgeons who were involved in that case said to me, we couldn't believe what you were doing. But after 28 hours, the operation was over. When we made the last cut that separated them over the stereo system came the hallelujah chorus. Everybody had goosebumps. And when we finished the operation, one of the twins opened his eyes reached for the endotracheal tube. The other one did the same thing. By the time we got to the ICU, within two days, they were exubated. Within three days, they were eating. Within two weeks, they were crawling. And today, they're perfectly functional adult human beings. And the people in South Africa were just beside themselves. They were dancing in the streets because they were so proud that this had been done in their country and in their hospital. But the take home lesson there is, that would have never happened without the failure that had occurred a couple of years ago. And this is something that God can see. Those twins a couple of years before were doomed. They weren't gonna survive no matter what. But they paved the way for the first complexly joined twins ever to be separated with no neurological deficits. That's the way God works. That's why we have to be patient. That's why we have to be faithful. And I remember when I became the director at HUD, the secretary at HUD, some high government official came to me and said, congratulations, but you're gonna have to stop all this God stuff. This is the government. I tell them to go jump in the lake. <laughs> because, you know, none of this happens without God. He is the essential part. And that's how our country rose so quickly, because we honored God. And as we're allowing him to be pushed out, it will decline just as quickly. But I don't think it's too late. We can do something about it. And those people who say, you're not supposed to talk about God in public. What do they know? Do they realize that our founding document, the Declaration of Independence, talks about certain unalienable rights given to us by our Creator, a.k.a. God? That the Pledge of Allegiance to that flag says we are one nation under God. The many courtrooms in the land on the wall, it says, in God we trust. Every coin in our pocket, every bill in our wallet says, in God we trust. So if it's in our founding documents, it's in our pledge, it's in our courts, and it's on our money, but we're not supposed to talk about it. What in the world is that? In medicine, we call it schizophrenia. <laughs> and doesn't that explain a lot of what's going on in our society today? And we need to make it perfectly clear that it's okay to live by godly principles of loving your neighbor, 
of caring for those who can't care for themselves, of developing your God-given talents to the utmost so that you become valuable to the people around you, of having values and principles that govern your life. And if we do that, not only will we have a great nation, but we will have one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, congratulations, and Godspeed.